Hello, friends. We love spending time outdoors, even when we are snuggling and relaxing. But we hate mosquitoes. And this hammock isn't nearly big enough for our whole family, which is why we built this hanging bed for our screened-in deck two years ago. It was wonderful, and we practically lived out here in the spring and fall. But then we did something a little crazy. We sold it. Now, I know what you're thinking. If we loved it so much, why did we get rid of it? Well, friend, we did it for you. This way, we could remake our favorite build and give you a chance to see it come together. Only, this time we are going to take the skills we have learned to make it even better. We'll be using a new species of wood and utilizing our favorite exterior finish to really enhance this piece. Come join us on our adventure! This build has definitely been our most popular one over on our blog, and we have the plans available on our site or on Etsy. Those links will be in the description below. We'll be following those plans today with just a few slight modifications. The first major change comes in our wood selection. When we first built this bed, we used 4x6 pine timbers since those were readily available. But this bed does have some minor exposure to the elements and we wanted to make sure that it lasts a lifetime. So we need something more rot resistant. Cedar is available in this size, but it's too soft to survive the dogs and the kids. Yes, everybody cuddles on this day bed. So we went looking to see if better options were available. White oak has a more defined grain pattern than we'd prefer, while mahogany and Spanish cedar are both at-risk species. Since we try to minimize our impact on the environment, we wanted a FSC Pure Certified Wood, so those two wood types were out. And don't even get me started on how crazy expensive teak is. It's crazy expensive. This hunt finally led us to Red Grandis Eucalyptus, also known as Rose Gum. It is an FSC Pure Certified Hardwood that is native to Australia, but it is also grown on plantations in tropical areas like South America. Red Grandis is a fair bit harder than cedar, but not as hard as oak, so it is easy to work with. It's a cost-effective and environmentally friendly alternative to mahogany, much like the sapelli that we use for our modern bed build. However, it is softer than sapelli, and it doesn't have the same chatoyancy, but that'll be covered by our exterior finish anyways. This is more affordable and easier to work with. Fun fact! Red Grandis was the award winner for product innovation and leadership in the woodworking industry in the category of Green Environmental Leadership in Raw Materials at the 2011 AWFS convention in Las Vegas. The one downside is that since this tree grows so straight and tall, the boards from it can be quite long and wide. Luckily, our hardwood dealer helped us size everything pretty well to minimize our waste, but we're going to need to start by cutting our boards down. First, we need to evaluate our lumber to determine which grain patterns we want to feature on the outside of our boards. We give the wood a light spritz of water to reveal the grain and pick out the sections we like the most. Since we'll be doubling up these boards to make thicker ones, we make sure the less attractive sections will be on the interior face. We notate on each board where it will go, and then we get to work breaking them down. The first order of business is to cut them to length. We want to leave each board at least two inches longer so that we can clean up the ends later. Luckily, since we bought 15 foot boards, we don't have too much waste on these cuts. With our cuts marked, we bring them over to the miter saw and cut them to their rough length. The widest board was just barely too wide for the miter saw, so we had to finish it off with our pole saw. But considering how wide some red grandest boards can be, this really isn't too bad. It's just a little bit of extra work and we're ready to head over to the table saw. On the table saw, we rip these boards down to about an inch wider than we need them. This lets us get two boards out of the widest board and save a few strips of material that we can use for a different project from the narrower boards. We don't like to waste wood, so we're always looking for ways to minimize our scrap. That starts when choosing our board faces and continues through every step of our process. Once the boards are cut to their rough dimensions, we're ready to start laminating them together. Since we couldn't buy nice hardwood in the 4 inch thickness, we're gluing two of these 2 inch thick boards together. Ours have already been surfaced down to an inch and 13 sixteenths because the imperial measurement system just loves crazy fractions. So all we're going to do now is use a sanding block with 120 grit sandpaper to quickly knock off any high spots and ensure that we get a good glue joint. 
With our boards ready, we break out the glue, and I mean a lot of glue. As in, we had to run to the store and buy a whole jug of glue, because our little bottle was not going to be nearly enough. But the last thing we want is to have a bad glue joint here. Once the glue is all spread out, we place the boards together and start clamping them down. We have a lot of clamps, but not nearly enough to do giant laminations like this. We should probably double up our number of clamps for situations like this, because we always seem to run out. We have pretty good glue squeeze out on this board, but we're still bound to have gaps. There is enough warp in them from how they settled after being surfaced that they don't sit perfectly flat on each other. Wood moves, and it's just something that you'll have to work around. After giving the glue time to set up, we pull off all of our clamps and repeat this process on the next pair. It's slow going, but it'll be worth it for this finished daybed. And by the next day, the glue is dried and these boards are ready to be trimmed down to their final size. Before we can cut these boards down, we first need to make sure that we have a straight edge to reference. Unfortunately, this means scraping off all that dried glue. We'd intentionally left one edge overhanging the other so that we could get a good straight edge, but didn't think to scrape off the glue while it was still setting up. All these drip bumps will hit our table saw fence, so they have to go. With our straight edge back, it's time for one of the most nerve-wracking parts of the whole build. Our table saw blade isn't tall enough to go through the entire board in one pass, so we are going to have to make two passes. That means cutting the board, then flipping it over, and cutting it again. Our cuts have to be pretty perfect to ensure they line up, and with these being massive boards, that can be pretty tricky. Thankfully, having a second person makes a huge difference. One of us can press the board tight against the fence while the other feeds the board through the blade. It's slow going, but we have to make it all the way through. Then we flip the board over and run it through again. Our saw definitely wasn't thrilled by this, but I'm glad we didn't go with the harder wood or we would have had to make several passes on each side of the board. Eventually we make it all the way through the board and reveal our lamination line. It turned out pretty well. Nothing a little sanding can't clean up at least. We repeat this process on the other three boards and then we move our fence to the final width of these boards. Using the face we cut previously as our reference surface, we cut each of the boards to their final dimension. Next, we move on to our poplar boards. These four quarter thick common boards are going to be the slats for the daybed. We start by trimming one end and then cutting each board to length. Since these are common boards, they have a lot of defects that we have to work around. So we try to plan the cuts to remove the worst bits of each end. This leaves us with a fair bit of offcuts that we can use for things like jigs or DIY toys like our salt writing tray. Once the boards are the right length, we bring them over to the table saw and rip them to width. Since the boards are various widths, we deviate from the plans a bit here. Rather than cutting each board to 3.5 inches and wasting a lot of material, we vary the thickness of the slats to maximize the usage of each board. On this project, that tended to mean we were cutting these slats around 2.5 to 3 inches, but we ended up with 19 slats when we were done instead of 16. Next up, we're going to cut the slat support rails. These are from a nicer grade of 8 quarter poplar, so there aren't really any defects that we have to work around. We just cut them to length and then rip them to width. Ta-da! It took three days of work, but we're finally to the point where we would have started if we'd bought construction lumber. Except, we now have much nicer wood to work with, and we'll have a furniture piece that will last much longer and look infinitely better. It's well worth the time and investment to elevate this piece. We are going to add a decorative chamfer to the ends of these 4x6 boards, but first we need to cut them to length. Since this length and chamfer aren't functional, they don't have to be perfect cuts, so we're going to do them out on the miter saw. Just remember to be careful with how much you are cutting off so that this doesn't happen. Whoops. Yeah. With those cuts done, we can start on the chamfers. To make this more repeatable, we first mark out where we want the chamfer to fall, and then add a clamp to the speed square to act as a stop block. This allows us to quickly mark the same chamfer on each of the next boards. 
We position the board on the saw so that our drawn line matches up with the laser line, and then make the cut. This saw didn't come with a laser line, but we added one to it using a disc that goes between the blade and the arbor nut. We'll leave a link below in case anyone else needs one. They make things so much easier. Since these boards are so thick and wide, the blade can't quite make it through the front edge of the board. So it's time to break out the pole saw again. There is only a small amount of material left, so this goes pretty quickly. Ta-da! Now we can flip the board around to mark the other side. With the speed square set up, this takes seconds and we're ready to cut. We just repeat the process to cut the other corners. One of the things to keep in mind is that removing these corners gives you the opportunity to remove defects. We had a few checks in the ends of a couple of the boards that we were able to cut out when we cut off these corners. There are still a few cracks present, but we will fill all those in later. If you watched our last video on the tomato trellis, you'll know that we used a template with our routers to make some of the assembly features. We're going to repeat that process today, only this time we're going to be using some of the poplar offcuts to make our template. We start by cleaning up one face of a board. Then we set the table saw fence to be just as wide as one of the pieces and rip the board down to match that width. This will give us our perfect board spacing. Now we just need to cut a few more pieces to go on either side of the board. We're leaving one board longer so that we can attach some more offcuts to it as reference features in order to get repeatable cuts. Once we have all the pieces cut, we bring them over to one of the timbers. We start by measuring and tracing out our cut pattern using the speed square, and oh no. That's the frozen shock of a man who just realized that he cut the chamfers at 45 degrees instead of 60. Yep, that means that there won't be enough material on the underside of the board to put the rope to hang this bed. I won't sugarcoat it, I was pretty pissed at myself. Luckily. Amanda is here to remind me that mistakes are part of DIY. We all make them, no matter the experience level, and we learn from them and get better as we go. So we're going to have to adapt. We'll move the location of our half left joint about an inch and a half, and we may have to adjust the size of our futon to fit this new dimension or have it overhang. We put the template piece in position and clamp it down. Now we spread some super glue along the edge of one of the other pieces. Spray the clamped piece with accelerator and then press them together. On the other side, we start by gluing one of the off cuts to the edge of the pieces. This gives us a reference for the top face of the board. Then we just glue that piece to the clamped piece and we now have a template that references our top face. With our template in its new position and clamped down, we bring over the plunge router with a template bit. We set the first step so the bearing rides along the top of our template and make the first cut. Then we plunge deeper and make the second cut. Since this cut is going to go all the way through the board, we don't need to remove all the material. We can just trace the outer path and then cut out the rest of the material. We now remove the template and place our plunge router directly on the piece. Again, we follow the perimeter and increment the depths until we bottom out the travel of our plunge router. One tip when you are routing pieces like this is to score your wood. This helps prevent any chip out when the router gets to the end of the cut. If you don't, you might end up with something like this. Whoops, we'll have to glue that back on. Let's go ahead and score the rest of the pieces before we forget again. We then repeated this process over on the other joints. Unfortunately, a screw head worked its way loose on the router and fell into the cut groove where it met the router bit. They came from different worlds, but when they connected, it was like fireworks. They had a brief and intense romance, but unfortunately, they perished. It was a tale reminiscent of Romeo and Juliet. Truly tragic. Luckily, I had a spare screw and we needed a new template routing bit anyways. With those installed, it's back to work. We finished up routing as deep as our new template bit would go on all the pieces, which is about halfway through these boards. Now we flip the boards over and trace our template pattern. We could repeat the same process with the template bits, but we don't trust ourselves to perfectly align the cuts. Instead, we are going to cut out this portion and then use a flush trim bit to clean it up. To make this easier, we drill out the corners with a large drill bit and then use a jigsaw to cut just inside the template line. The drilled holes make it easier to turn the jigsaw and cut the back of the pocket. 
Unfortunately, our jigsaw blade wasn't quite long enough, but we use our trusty pole saw to cut the last little bit. Then we just give it a little tap to break off the last little bit of material and the chunk is free. Now it's time to trim the joint flush. Since these boards were so big, we needed to get a new flush trim bit. This two inch long monster will do the job, but we have to be very careful about the kickback. We carefully lead the bit into the cut and work our way around. We're taking shallow passes here and slowly leading the bit into the material so it doesn't grab. As we get to the end, we back off and leave some extra material. If we try to cut the end, it is likely to blow out. Like this. Scoring the wood isn't enough when you're dealing with a bit this long. You can try climb cutting this edge, but that doesn't always work out. The best way we have found to deal with this scenario is to clamp a piece of wood to the end of this cut to help reinforce our boards. Then we can slowly work our way through this last chunk of material until everything is nice and flush. For more hard learned tips on how to not destroy your pieces, be sure to subscribe to our channel and check out our other videos as well. Or you can stay here and watch us get covered in dust and make a ton of wood shavings. They're so soft and fluffy! All that's left is to clean up the corners of these cuts so the boards will fit together cleanly. And just like that, the giant half laps are done. The next thing that we have to do on these massive boards is to drill the holes for the movable headboard panels. To make this process easier, we bought one of these portable drill presses. It will ensure that our drill stays plumb to the face of the board and it's much easier to manage than trying to bring our massive boards over to a drill press. Before we can use it though, we need to make sure we have a flat surface to reference, which means all these resaw marks have to go. We break out the orbital sander, slap some 80 grit 3M extract sandpaper on it, and get to work. An hour or two later, we have all four of these boards nice and smooth, and we're ready to drill some holes. First, we carefully measure and mark the hole locations. Accurate spacing between each set of two holes is important to ensure that we can reverse the headboards later. Next, we used an improvised center punch, and by that I mean a screwdriver, to mark the center locations for these holes and keep our bit from wandering. Now we chuck up an eighth inch drill bit and drill a quick pilot hole on our punch mark. Our portable drill press ensures this pilot hole is plumb to the boards. With the pilot holes in place, we check up a Forstner bit and get to drilling. We set the drill speed to low and only pull the trigger partially so that we can get a good cutting action. As we progress deeper into the hole, we repeatedly pull the bit back up and use a vacuum to clear out the chips. This keeps the bit running cooler and ensures it stays sharp longer. To get as deep as possible, we removed the spring and depth stop from the drill press and just drilled until the chuck almost touched the board's face. Then we repeat this process for the rest of the holes. There is just one thing left to do on these boards, and that's to make a pocket for our bed support board to sit into. To start, we mark the center of our template and center of the boards. Then we just have to line up the marks, clamp our template in place, and get to routing. This is very similar to the half lap joint process, but the cut is much shallower, so we only need to use a template bit. It does mean that we have to remove all of the material with the router bit though, but this still goes quickly and we have a perfect pocket in no time. This is so much faster than using the oscillating mold tool like we did last time we built this bed. The final cuts that we have to make for this hanging bed are the platform supports and their slats. Before we cut them to length though, we first dry fit the 4x6 timbers together. These joints aren't as tight as I would want for a glue up, but they are perfect for a piece that will get assembled after finishing and will need to be disassembled if we ever move. Once the timbers are all together, we bring the platform support boards over to the bed frame and mark their length. We'll cut these about an eighth of an inch short just to give us a little play during assembly. Once the supports are in, we can also check the fit of the platform slats. These slats will curve to meet the support boards, so the fit is a little more difficult to gauge. You can press a board into place, mark it, and then adjust its length until it drops into place. And once you've dialed in the length for one, it's easy to adjust the lengths for all the other boards. 
Now, it's time to round over all the edges. Starting with the platform boards, we add a nice big round over to all the edges to really soften them up. We use a quarter inch for these. For the platform support boards, we put an eighth inch round over on most of the edges, but a few of the edges will have a larger round over. Like right here where the center support sits into its pocket. Since we used a half inch diameter bit to make this pocket, we put a quarter inch radius on these two corners so that we can drop this piece in perfectly without having to chisel out the corners. Hooray for time savings! On pretty much everything else, we just put an eighth inch round over on every edge. It's a small detail, but it really elevates the piece. The moment you touch it, you go, ooh, that's nice. It just gives the piece a quality, tactile sensation that we've fallen in love with. And this trim router makes it so easy and consistent. It has quickly become one of our favorite tools. The last step before finishing is to sand anything that hasn't been sanded yet. Rubio recommends sanding everything to 120 grit. This is especially true if you're using a wood that doesn't absorb moisture easily like this red grandis. It's also known as rose gum because its pores are naturally filled with resin. While this makes it great for outdoor furniture, it makes it difficult to finish. To combat that, we are going to sand at 80 grit, then water pop to raise the grain. Then we sand to 120 grit, making sure to get an even and thorough coverage. Then we blow off the dust and wipe down the pieces with mineral spirits to remove any dust and as much resin as possible. If you want a smoother finish and are okay with the lighter color, then go ahead and take it up to 180 grit, but I wouldn't go past that. Rubio only recommends 150 max, but we have gotten good results with 180 on other projects. To finish these pieces, we're going to be using our favorite exterior finish, Rubio Monocoat's Hybrid Wood Protector. This finish isn't quite as easy to apply as their Oil Plus 2C, but it is still very straightforward, and they make it easy to get a good result. Since this piece will be heavily touched, we are starting by mixing a 10% hardener with the finish. Then it's just a matter of brushing it on. We opted to use the black color finish. It looks incredibly dark going on, but much of this will soak in and it will produce a beautiful dark brown once it's wiped off. Once the piece is fully brushed, we set a timer for 10 minutes while we move on to the next piece. After the timer goes off, we come back and back brush the piece and then set a new timer for 5 minutes to let it finish soaking in. Once that is done, we come back with a rag and buff off all the excess finish. Look at that beautiful grain and color. Now we flip the pieces over and repeat the process on the other side before setting these set aside to dry. You don't really have to worry about lines when you set these to dry, but we always try to minimize contact on visible surfaces. It's a good idea to come back later in the day and shift them so that the new point is touching and the original point can get air and finish curing. Now, we won't bore you with the whole finishing process, so we'll stop talking for a moment so you can enjoy this beautiful reveal. We used a lot of tools while making this hanging bed but the plunge router was definitely the MVP of this build. What's your favorite tool to use? Let us know in the comments below and we'll see which tool is the most popular. A few days later, all of our pieces are dry and we're ready for the final assembly. We'll start by carrying the boards up to our screened in deck where we'll put the frame together. This bed would be too heavy and large to move later, so we want to assemble it in its final location. We start by slotting the joints together and then pre-drilling a countersink for two screws in each corner. We then switch over to a longer drill bit and check to make sure each corner is square. Once everything is squared up, we pre-drill the holes to their full depths. We want to make sure that the screws that go in don't push the boards out of square. So with the holes ready, all we have to do is drive the screws into the bottom of each joint to pin them together. Then, we drop in the middle support board and screw it into place as well. If I was selling this piece, or expected to take it apart often, I would have made these threaded fasteners and bolts, but screws will work well enough for us here. Now for the tricky part. We have to flip the frame over without accidentally smacking the low slanted ceiling. I suggest always placing something soft under one side, 
the help from scratching your finish. Thankfully, this went pretty well for once, and we can continue on our assembly. Next up, we're going to install the side platform support boards. These just press up against the bed frame and get screwed into place. Since all of the platform pieces are made from poplar, they might not last as long as the red grandis frame. We are using screws to attach all of these pieces so that they can be replaced one day. Hopefully the Rubia will help them last for many many years, but it's better to have a backup plan. With that, we're ready to drop in the platform support boards. We start by spacing them out to make sure we have consistent gaps. Then, one by one, we flex the boards and drop them between the frame so that they touch the middle platform support board. Standing on the board to keep it flexed, we drive a screw through the middle of the board and into the platform support board. We repeat this process for all of the boards to create this relaxing curved surface. And then, because I'm an engineer and I like to overbuild things, I go through and I screw down the boards on each end as well. Ta-da! We have a bed frame. Now we just have to get it hung up using ropes. To do this, we've installed these eye bolts above the four corners of our hanging bed. Since we didn't want one joist to handle the load of two corners, we distributed the load by staggering the ropes between two joists on each side. Then, we raise the bed up and set it on some blocks, so that it is at our desired height, and feed our rope through the eye bolts and down to the bed. To hang the bed, we didn't want to put eye bolts in our frame or anything like that. Instead, we wrap the rope around the bed in a way that binds the corner tight and looks amazing. Hold on, let me replay that for you in slow-mo. Pretty cool, huh? Now, we just need to tie off our ropes up at the eye bolts into an elaborate knot to hide the ugly hardware and hot glue the loose ends so everything looks nice and neat. Once that's done on all four corners, we can pull the blocks away and we have a hanging bed. Quick tip, hang the bed a little higher than you want it to be. The cotton rope, like what we used, will stretch out a little over time due to having weight on it, so the bed will start to hang lower after a while. All that's left to do now is to make the bed. We start by dropping on a foam pad in our futon. We probably could have skipped the foam pad if we had bought a better futon, but we never bought a futon before and had no idea where to shop or what to look for. Thus, the foam cushion. The original hanging bed was one of our favorite builds we have ever done but this version is improved upon it in every way. It's amazing to see how our skills have grown over the last few years and to know that we can get completely different results out of the same set of plans. The bed still needs its headboards, but that will be in our next video. We were originally going to have one long video, but this build was so involved that a single video would have been an hour long. To keep the YouTube algorithm and you happy, we decided it'd be better to split the video in two. So if you've enjoyed this video, be sure to click through and watch that headboard video and subscribe. Thanks for watching!